The energy ministry is attributing recent power outages in parts of the country to a shutdown of the gas processing plant at Etiabu. The project will enable gas produced from fuels in the western region to be pumped to Tema for use by power plants there. Deputy Minister in Charge of Power, William Uruku Edu, apologized for the erratic nature of the electric supply he says may persist for another 10 days and urge the public to bear with the authorities as the challenges are resolved. The Ghana gas plant shutdown, according to authorities, will last between 10 to 12 days, but that alternate fuel has been imported to save the day. There's more in the following report. Okay, so in recent weeks, there's been prolonged and frequent power outages across the country. Question many people have been asking is, are we back to the dark days? That is doom so. This is not what we were promised. This is not what we were told. Last time I was watching uh, the uh, TV news, it was told that uh, they are giving us just a time frame of one week. It's past one week now. So why, why are the uh, uh, electricity Ghana company doing that? It's, it's so bad. As, as, as we're speaking, uh, the power went off last night. And it's not come up to now. And as I'm speaking to you right now, my phone is off. The room is hot. You can't sleep. The kids can't sleep. Everybody's miserable. Now, today, the Minister of Energy called an emergency press conference to address the nation as far as the power situation is concerned. There have been some concerns that we do not have enough fuel to power the plants. Where we are now is the country where, just in the background, you would find uh, trucks that are loading fuel for onward transmission. Once this uh, shutdown is complete, we will be in a position to transport gas from the west, the Takradi area, to Tema, where we have uh, generators that require gas. They depend on gas from Nigeria. We've heard this severally that oh, gas from Nigeria is not coming, the pressure is low. Instead of 120 million scarves, we are getting only 30. After this, it's going to be a thing of the past. The deputy minister, however, says the intolerant manner Ghanaians treat the recent outages is a vote of confidence the people have in the administration to deliver uninterrupted power. We do apologize for the inconvenience that is being caused. And you know, it is um, really interesting that um, Ghana has gotten to the state that we are. Within just two years of Nana Kufuatu's government, Ghanaians are not tolerant of one week of um, power disturbance. And that is saying something, that it's only a week and it's um, causing a, great, a lot of um, difficulty and inconvenience to people, but they cannot stand it. Not, with, not unlike some time back where we had to endure years and years of, um, let me finish, years and years of um, um, doing so. In a set the record straight fashion, the CEO of Tema Oil Refinery Mr. Isaac Osei outlined the amount of fuel his outfit has, disputing claims the country does not have enough fuel to power the plants. 10,500 metric tons of agu, that's uh, uh, diesel. And uh, this was brought in for VRA. And it was brought in by uh, Stratcon and Go Energy. Uh, two of our uh, BDCs. Secondly, we received 11,000 metric tons of heavy fuel oil, HFO, and it's been earmarked for AXA. This was brought in by Go Energy. And then thirdly, we've received also 300,000 barrels of light crude oil. Uh, this is it's been designated for VRA, and we have it in tank. What we have done so far, we are now in the process of loading uh, BRVs, um, which are destined for AXA. We can do about 1,000 uh, metric tons a day. We have... Um, asked uh, the NPA to give us permission to load after 6 o'clock. And we are prepared to work on Saturday to ensure that we can do 1,500. 6 o'clock to 10 p.m., we want that additional time, and we'll work on Saturdays, and possibly on Sundays also, to ensure that the entire stock of 10,000 uh, metric tons 
um, uh, no, uh, of 11,000 metric tons find its way to um, AXA. The ministry at the news conference promised to take journalists to three sites in Tema, namely the Tema oil refinery and the Asogli and AXA power plant to prove fuel is not the reason for the outages. The tour, however, ended at the refinery. It is therefore unclear whether the AXA and Asogli plants are indeed producing at full capacity as had been suggested by the ministry at the news conference. In a related development, former energy minister Kofi Bua has rejected government's explanation for the recent power outages. He says the issue with shortfall in gas supply from Itabo was anticipated and adequate measures should have been put in place to avoid the current challenge. Mr. Bua blamed lack of planning and advised government to stop explaining the situation and just turn the light on. Why is it, what amount of planning has gone into it? Uh, were we able to plan enough to ensure that those thermal plants that will really uh, suffer when it comes to the containment of gas? Do we make sure they have enough crude oil? It looks like there was a lot of planning that was not in place. It's clear to me. And so that question should be probed. Uh, did the government put in p proper planning to ensure that since they knew ahead that this work was, uh, was coming up. What steps did they take? The second important point is that we need to also find out, okay? And I understand that there were, uh, 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 the issue of the pylons, the destruction, and its impact, it was also an issue. But all together, as I'm speaking to you, I'm just reading a text. We're a Ghana Great Company. The transporter of power is on its knees because they've not been able to pay workers. Okay? We know the challenges with ECG. Is it true or not that the power utilities, the critical frontliners, are in debt and in crisis? Is it a fact? What impact is that having on our power stability? You, as journalists, should be interested in. So, the point that I'm making is that it is not too helpful for the government to be assigning reason every morning. The people of Ghana are interested in ensuring that the light is on. And that's what this government should do. No excuses. We have enough generation. We have put in enough measures to bring in gas. We have put in even the financial engineering to ensure that on an annual basis this money. What is happening? We're staying on the power situation. President Kufuado has expressed optimism the country will not go back to the days of doom. So, according to him, there is excess capacity to ensure the ready supply of electricity. His comments come as Ghanaians across the country express frustration with the recent power outages. The president was responding to some questions from members of the Ghanaian community in the U.S. at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, where he addressed a gathering earlier on Monday. Except for one or two unfortunate days, Tumsa is no longer a phenomenon in our country. <laughs> we have been able to handle Tumsa. The huge debt, the five billion plus debt we had inherited over the energy sector, we've dealt with half of it. And we're in the process of redeeming the other half. Amen. Today we're exporting energy to Burkina Faso, we'll begin again to Togo because we have excess capacity and we're using it to derive more money for our country. It's important that we have reliable, secure supply of energy to be able to power the industries that are emerging, especially our box. All right, so that'll be it with the electricity situation. If you have any comments at all, you can go onto our Facebook pages and uh, just put those comments there. We're moving on to water now because there's a challenge there. Most parts of a crackled phase and acute water shortage soon if damaged water filters at the wager treatment plant are not fixed immediately. 
According to Municipal Chief Executive of the Wager Bawe Municipal Assembly, Patrick Kumo, the damage is putting pressure on the remaining eight filters, which, when not addressed immediately, could result in a permanent shutdown of the plant. Ifwa Evans January reports. The water treatment plant is on the verge of collapse following the damage of four water filters out of 12, putting pressure on the remaining eight. According to Municipal Chief Executive of the Wajagbawe Municipal Assembly, Patrick Kumo, the damaged filters poses danger to the future of the plant if immediate attention is not taken. During a tour of the site, the MCE said this damage is as a result of a building on the water line. The eight, they are also old filters. And per the information that we picked on the ground, those eight two are not really in good conditions and they can give in at any time. And when that happens, you know, Guija supplies almost about 70% of the water in Greater Accra. And this will affect major institutions and areas in Greater Accra. I deem it fair to go there, ascertain it, and then, of course, get government to know so that quickly we can move in there to see how far best we can mitigate the situation before uh, the unforeseen event happens. We don't want to go back to the days where we have uh, Kufour gallons and other things coming up in Greater Accra. So the reason why I have to go there to get first-hand information uh, what is really happening over there. Then, of course, we'll report to the sector ministries and then also copy the presidency for action to be taken. But my advice will also go to the managers of uh, the, uh, the, the, the treatment plants. I believe management needs to be up and doing. If situations are there, you don't cover it up, you, let, you have to let the appropriate authorities know so that quickly we can all get it done and done with. The filters at the treatment plants are designed to run for about 48 hours, but currently operators of the plant have to wash these filters every 12 hours, a situation that threatens the smooth operation of the plant. Well, elsewhere, water supply crisis in the Sekandita Kradi metropolis in the Western region has been attributed to activities of a quarry company which has mounted its operations on the Anankore River, which is a main source of water for the Ghana Water Company's treatment plant at Inchabang. The result, the plant is now only able to supply 1.4 million gallons of water a day from a previous high of 4 million gallons. They affect more than 400,000 residents in the metropolis have been grappling with persistent water shortages for more than a month. This was discovered after officials of the Ghana Water Company decided to investigate the sharp decline in the amount of water coming into the treatment plant. Westing Regional Director Engineer Mark Teko Kujo called on the authorities to bring the contractor of the quarry to book and to take remedial measures to ensure the river is revived. Uncle river is the source of raw water for Intraban Water Treatment Plant. Intraban Water Treatment Plant is, has a design capacity of 4 million gallons of water per day. Currently, we are just doing around 1.4, 1.5 million gallons of water. That translates into about 40% of design capacity. All because we are not getting enough water to feed the dam for us to abstract for our water treatment. The communities that are affected seriously if there is no water coming out of Javan treatment plant, are basically Shama, then Sekendi Township. Of course, this river, the dam also feeds, uh, we send water to Viare, which is of very critical nature. So basically the energy enclave around the Boadzi, uh, Viare area, they are all going to suffer if we don't get enough quantity of water to treat. So it is a big issue, not only for residential consumption, but equally for industrial use as well. If this situation goes on without redress, it is very likely that the dam level would go down and the obvious is that we may have to suspend operations. Well, the latest news reaching us is that the manager of the operations there that's uh, polluting the water 
uh, body has been arrested. And we'll get you the details in a bit when we're joined by our correspondent in Athalia uh, Kwanza. But the Catholic Relief Services, a uh, humanitarian organization of the Catholic community working to improve the well-being of the vulnerable in society has provided, provided 85 boreholes to communities, schools and health facilities in the Talensi district of the Upper East Region and the West Mampusi municipality of the North East Region. The organization has also trained mechanics resident in the areas where the boreholes have been constructed to ensure speedy repairs of the boreholes any time they break down. Upper East correspondent Albert Sorry has more. The provision of the 85 boreholes is in line with the vision of the Catholic Relief Services to contribute to improved access to water and sanitation in Ghana. This is under the Integrated Community Water Sanitation and Hygiene Improvement Project, a three-year project funded by the Helmsley Charitable Trust of the United States to the tune of $6.4 million. The boreholes are expected to provide clean drinking water to at least 100 communities in the Talensi District and the West Mampusi Municipality. To ensure uninterrupted flow of water, the Catholic Relief Services has also trained mechanics who are resident in these areas to ensure that the boreholes are promptly repaired anytime they break down. Alexander Obobisa Dakun works with the Catholic Relief Services. These area mechanics are people from within the communities and we have identified them because they initially possess some technical skills and so we identified them through a criteria and they have gone through series of training and today we have to inaugurate them in order that we will give them the power and the ability to actually begin their business of maintaining the water points that we have provided. The mechanics who were eight in number, were integrated into the area mechanics network. Their chairman, Bismarck Buguri, called on the community members to also play a role to help in the maintenance of the boreholes. What we need to do is, we have to always make sure our uh, caretakers in the communities, they should always go to the boreholes, check it uh, every period, every two, three weeks, check it well so that maybe there will not be problem. In case they go there and see someone doing a different thing, pumping wrongly, then they will draw him or her attention back so that you know how to pump it well and then it can last for them. The Integrated Community Water Sanitation and Hygiene Improvement Project is also constructing over 150 gender sensitive and disability friendly latrines in 80 schools and several healthcare centers. West Mampusi Municipal Chief Executive Abu Mohammed, in his speech read on his behalf, applauded the Catholic Relief Services for supporting government's efforts to provide safe drinking water for all Ghanaians. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, reporting from Karmenga. All right, we're returning to our earlier story on the water crisis, water supply crisis situation in the Sekendi Takwadi metropolis. We're joined by Radio Max's Inathalia Kwanza to give us a, a, an accurate representation of the situation there. Hello, Ina. Now, we're learning that uh, 1.4 million gallons of water is not supplied to the metropolis, but they are required 4 million gallons. That's quite a shortfall. How are the people coping? Yes, so Israel, right now the situation is so bad that for the past one month, some of them intermediately have water, and then some of them would have to wake up as early as 2 a.m., keep watch at their tap to see if there is going to be a drop of water. Other people who are, fortunate, who are fortunate enough that have boreholes around their vicinity have to resort to boreholes. All right. We have been speaking with some of them. Let's, uh, let's listen to what they've had to say. All right, but Ina, we are unable to bring uh, our viewers that sound bite, but let's, we're also learning that some arrest has been made. You tell us about that. 
So, Nkia Maseko Kujo, who is the regional Ghana Water Director in the Western Region, says that after they had realized that it was because of activities of um, or some Jojo mining quarry, which is making uh, them unable to produce that 4 million gallons of water, they reported the case to the police yesterday, and then the man in question or the contractor has been arrested. But Israel, this morning, when we, get to, when we got to site, um, his men were working. They were moving the quarry in and out along the river bank. So you're saying that even though the manager has been arrested, the operations have not ceased? No, Israel. This morning when we got there, they were working. And they, they didn't even look like some people who, who were scared of the fact that the Ghana Water Company officials were there. There were officials from the PURC also there. And then later in the afternoon, the Metropolitan Chief Executive of SCMA, Anthony K.K. Sam, and his men went there to see the thing for themselves. I understand they'll be going there tomorrow again to find out if these people are still there working. So you mean the um, MCE went there and still they didn't stop working? That's what I understand. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that was, uh, that's Radio Max's in Athalia Kwanza bringing us uh, up to speed with developments there in the Sekandi Takradi metropolis. You're watching Joy News Prime and we're taking a break. We're still ahead. Lawyers for driver and mate accused of faulting, assaulting policemen in viral video to gather evidence to back torture claims. Once you have the necessary evidence, then we would advise on the steps to take. But if there has really been um, abuse, like it's been alleged, we would definitely take it forward. A wager circuit court on Monday sets April 15 as the date to commence the trial. A driver of a driver and is since in charge with assault of a policeman captured in a viral video. This was after police prosecutors had presented to the court evidence to be used against the two accused. Copies of the evidence has also been handed to the accused persons who have been represented by a team of nine legal practitioners. The two were billed on Friday with their lawyers accusing the police of brutalizing them while they were in their custody. Doctors who examined the two say their, their report confirms torture. Join us as Henry Christie to follow them to the hospital and hear his report. The cry of a scared driver and his mate remanded in police custody after they were charged with various counts of assault on a police officer. According to them, past experiences meant they will not be spared as they were to spend about two weeks in police custody. Days after they were granted bail, driver Francis Boabing and his mate Albert Ansan narrate how they were subjected to inhumane treatment while in police custody. When I took my medical report to the Odoko police station, the officers didn't even look at it. They started beating me from the time I was arrested until I was taken to court. When the judge reminded us, we knew we wouldn't be spared. The investigator said we should plead guilty and our sentence may be reduced. But we did otherwise because we were innocent. After the court hearing, they beat us some more. An Odoko police officer with the name Segbefia handcuffed me and punched me. They beat us as if we were murderers. The situation got worse when we were taken to the CID headquarters. Female police officers also beat us with handcuffs in their hands. The BNI helped us. I They made me sleep in the bathroom when I was arrested. The bathroom was so small I struggled to sleep. On Friday, March 15, when my driver was also arrested, 
He joined me in the bathroom together with other inmates. Counter back. Second, so I'm not nash inside. No, no, no. So on the later, no buy inside. No, every Friday, no buy inside. No, me ni 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 ane dey drive ho. E drive ho yon ni pa be. And before we were taken to court, any police officers who had seen the viral video and felt like beating us did. The police officer we fought also had his turn and hit me hard in the head. My pelvic area was stomped at the CID's anti arm robbery unit. The BNI saved us. They didn't lay a finger on us. They took us to the hospital for treatment. <laughs> Medical officer at the Opoku Wari Hospital, Dr. Alfred Opoku, tells Joy News his evaluation on Francis and Albert shows evidence of assault. The driver is um, Francis Wabin. He presented with a painful right, um, painful right eye, left ear pain, back, and then a back, a severe back ache. And um, when I examined him, uh, well, the left eye, the right eye, sorry, looked a bit reddish, and then the left ear also looked reddish. Now, I've put him on antibiotics and, sent, and then some painkillers also for his back, and then uh, I've asked him to come back in a week's time. I'll review him. Uh, if he doesn't do too well, I may request um, x-rays of the back, the chest, and then I also send him to see the ENT specialist at Kolebu. The other man, also he came in with a, a catar that he's had for some time, and then he also complained of severe, extreme, uh, severe headaches. He also had general uh, body pains. Member of the legal team for the two, Cynthia Nimo Apredo, tells Joy News they are gathering the necessary evidence to back the torture claims. Um, so what we had to do was basically to take the necessary documents on the docket from the prosecutor and then ask for an agenda date when we take a seat and then review the documents and then take the necessary directions in terms of how the trial should proceed. Mm -hmm. Um, the bit about um, their assault, we, we have in fact engaged doctors who examined them, uh, who say that they saw signs that indicate that they have indeed been assaulted, as you had been informed when you visited them. Uh, how far do you intend to take this matter? Um, so, well, I'm not privy to the information you got from the doctor's office, uh, but basically there's been an allegation of the sort, like you rightly said, and what we'll do is to make sure that we gather the necessary evidence, because you know you can't just make allegations and then uh, you can make a big case out of that, but once you have the necessary evidence, then we would advise on the steps to take, but if there has really been um, abuse like it's been alleged, we will definitely take it forward. Mm. And for the trial proper, what are your expectations? We understand that uh, you also have been able to engage some witnesses who uh, were present on the day of the incident that you intend to bring to the court to testify in favor of your clients. Yes, yeah, so we are making those contacts and uh, once we have them, we'll proceed. But the documents that you talked about, you have every complement of the evidence the state intends to use? We are yet to review the document. We just received them in court today. The Accra Region Police has confirmed investigations into the alleged stabbing of an Uber driver. The driver who stabbed the passenger over a fair dispute has since been dropped by the ride hailing app. First, let's listen to the driver's narration. So you check the fare, and you check the fare, and the fare was 42 cities. So I, I, I questioned him that, no, <clears throat> it's not 42 cities, because the initial fare Uber gave to us was 25 cities. So I can't pay 42 cities. So he said, no, he's going to take my documents that he brought back to the one who sent, the sender, the one who sent the document. And I told you, the person that you are going, he's not even there at the moment, he has left. So why are you taking the document to? And he said, no, then he will keep the document. I said, no, you can't keep my doc. They are my car documents. I'm going somewhere. I'm, so take this money and, 
and leave and report, and Uber will solve your issue for you. And he said no. So he tried snatching my documents for me. So when he snatched it, and I said, oh, no, that, those are my car documents. You can't take them. And he snatched it, and he, he was going into his car. So I rushed to snatch my document. I wanted to pick my document back. Then he started struggling with me, you understand? So in the council family, he reached into his car and picked out a very big kitchen knife. So he threatened he would stab me with a kitchen knife. And I said, no, you can't keep my documents until you try to stab me. And I'll just look at you and you drive away. No. So I told him, no, I don't, I don't care. I don't care if he even stabs me or something. He should give me my documents. So when I tried going for the documents, you know, he sat in the car. So when he sat in the car, I said, no, I'll not allow you to leave the car with my documents. Then he, tried, he swung the knife at me. So he wanted to stab my side. So I, I quickly, I, I dodged. I, try, I, I tried dodging the knife. Then I blocked with my arm. And he stabbed my, 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 my arm right now. So we were very deep cut. So I was bleeding profusely. But I still didn't want to let him go because he wanted to drive away. Right, so there was the rider or passenger of that Uber uh, telling, talk, telling us his story on Friday. Now, public relations officer of the Accra Poli Region Police, CSP Fiatenge, confirmed an official complaint has been lodged. Information is that the issue has come to the police and that was even far back on Friday. And um, this morning, they were in the process of arraigning them before the court. That is a suspect in this case. Um, however, when the victim was spoken to, he said that he wants to go for medical treatment this morning. So they will also um, arrange them before the court will be today uh, or tomorrow. We were told um, it was on Friday this morning mm -hmm. when the investigator spoke to the victim. He says that he needs to go for um, dressing this morning. She is not uh, very cumbersome at all. Um, we usually have to go for allocation of the doctors where a court is prescribed for the investigator for the case to be prosecuted. So it is not any cumbersome issue at all. What matters is for the due process to be followed. And I believe that maybe by tomorrow they should be in court. Now, Head of Communications for Uber West Africa, Francisca Uriri, says management is assisting the cantonment police to investigate the matter. This was contained in an email response to Joy News. Here are the details. So it says what's being described is deeply upsetting and is in clear violation of our community guidelines. Violence of any kind is not tolerated by Uber. Upon being made aware of this, our incident response team, who are trained to deal with any critical safety issues, have commenced outreach to the rider to offer our full support. The driver's access to the app has been immediately removed, and we are currently assisting the police and relevant law authorities with ongoing investigations in this case. And this is a statement from Francesca Uriri, who is the head of communications for Uber West Africa. Now, a group of drivers who converged at Joy News on Monday uh, have a challenging claims that the driver who stabbed the passenger belonged to the Uber platform. This is despite the official statement from the company, which I just shared with you. Now, the executive director of Kamen Professional Institute, Augusta Ali, is challenging government to prioritize vocational and skills development as an important tool for job creation in the country. According to her, if desirable attention is devoted to entrepreneurship, it would evolve, it will help solve the unemployment challenges facing the country. She spoke at the 12th graduation ceremony of Kamen Professional Institute in Accra. Joshua Smith has more in the following report. Kamin Professional Institute has over the years trained many people from Ghana and abroad as entrepreneurs in various fields. Speaking on the theme, ensuring equitable quality education, the role of TVET in job creation program, Executive Director Augusta Ali says, vocational skills education is important in the development of every nation and not a field for school dropout. I think this should start from home. It should start from parents encouraging their children, observing what their skills are and supporting them to grow. You know, from that path, they'll be able to make a choice. If we should always think um, being a doctor and an engineer is the way forward, I think we can all tell from now that there are a lot of people who have come out from the universities and are walking around two years, four years with no 
jobs. I think currently they have noticed it and some or most of them are now even beginning to learn skills to add up to whatever degree they've already achieved. In fact, parents should know, I believe they are seeing it from now, that a lot of people with skills are now being moving their industry. They are creating the jobs now and without the degrees, they are still on top. Executive Director of National Vocational Training Institute, NVTI, Maoshi Nudeko Awiti cautioned the public to desist from looking down on people who attend technical and vocational schools. We are very guilty of thinking that grammar education is the first. Many people don't think about selecting a vocational or technical school as the first choice. But how do we give respect to the TVET person? When somebody does not do well in, in class, they say, oh, Uncle C and San Ejuma, Meanwhile, if we want to change the landscape, we need to take a critical look at technical and vocational skills. Some graduates spoke to join us. It's true hard work and determination. I work as much as possible to get this an award. I was shocked, really shocked, because coming is about challenges because you really we work hard very hard to become one one of the best students and i really worked hard to become a one student some students were awarded diploma and certificates in their respective fields of study joshua smith report for joy news before we go we're bringing you the hotline documentary born too soon and according to the world health organization 15 million of these babies are born worldwide every year, even though there are healthcare facilities equipped to be able to nurture preterm babies to grow up and live normal, healthy lives. There are places in sub Saharan Africa where such babies and their parents have to face a lot of stigma, mainly due to ignorance and outmoded traditional beliefs. In some cases, the families are ostracized or the babies are killed. Our latest hotline documentary titled Born Too Soon joins us as Upper East Region correspondent. I will sorry, investigate how some preterm babies and their parents survived stigma and went on to live normal, successful lives. Stay tuned for the documentary, which comes up in a bit. My name is Israel. I thank you very much for watching Journey's Prime. Have a good night.